Oh, this, uh, <clears throat> this morning, uh, we're going to begin a mini-series, really mini, two weeks. <laughs> Not very much time to cover such a vast subject to deal with and to properly do it justice, but I want to begin a mini-series on marriage. Um, why? Why? I actually don't want to do it. <laughs> really don't. Um, In fact, as of yesterday, I thought God was going to be changing my course. I was hoping he would. I thought, Lord, I don't, I had this all prepared. And and I said, I'm not going to teach this. I I don't want to do it. And I was thinking the Lord was changing me. I was uncomfortable. And I was thinking, is this uncomfortability because the Lord doesn't want me to preach it? Or is it uncomfortability because I'm afraid of man? And it was because I was afraid of man. And so I His truth marches on, regardless if we like it or not, and uh, a biblical view of marriage is important for us to understand. So it's uncomfortable truth sometimes, and I don't mean to start a message off so like that way, but um, but I'm concerned for, uh, you probably can't see those letters, I could see it on my computer, I'm concerned for the state of our nation, and I'm concerned for this condition of our state. And uh, I'm concerned for the condition of the church. And I'm concerned for families. And ultimately the reason for that is because I'm concerned about marriages. And it's really in this way because marriages are the bedrock of society. It's just not something that can be overstated. That it is marriages are the very bedrock of society. And if you don't have strong marriages, you can't have healthy families. And if you don't have healthy families, you can't have a very healthy church. And if you don't have a healthy church, where there's no healthy church, the state won't be healthy and ultimately the nation. So it's this way, this triangle, this pyramid, because marriages are the bedrock of our society, okay? And uh, perhaps you think I'm responding to the issues of the day immediately at hand, such as gay marriage and all that, but actually it's not. I'm not really responding to that. Uh, It actually goes much deeper. My concerns, the attack on marriage goes much deeper than, than what we're seeing. That is just the surface, that's just the, the, the result of the attack on marriage. And um, so it actually goes a lot deeper than that. And I hope that within two weeks I can at least do some justice to the doctrine of marriage and uh, define the purpose of marriage as well as underscore its importance and teach what marriage depicts, what it's a picture of, and as well as next week, actually identify the destructive attitudes and behaviors in our nation and, sorry to say, in our church. The behaviors and attitudes towards marriage within our church. And uh, what is marriage? Well, marriage is an institution of God. Turn to Genesis chapter 2. It's an institution of God. Genesis chapter 2 should be easy to find. It's probably the second page of your Bible. Maybe the first. We're going to be in verse 19. Second chapter of Genesis, verse 19. I always try to wait till I hear the leaves of your Bible stop turning because I like you to be able to follow along. I don't want to leave you in the dust and have you wondering. So I'm in verse 19 here. And out of the ground... <coughs> The Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a help fit for him or meat for him. And the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman 
because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. And so what we see here is that God instituted marriage. It was not man. Man didn't institute it. Man didn't have the means to institute it. It wasn't man who created the idea. And it wasn't the state. The state didn't create the idea of of marriage. This was God's plan, God's institution. It's much more than a piece of paper. It's it's not simply a license hanging on a wall. It's, It's a covenant before a holy God. It's the most intimate of all earthly relationships. Sacred and pure. And I'm not talking about just the physical element of marriage, but the the intimacy of, of thought, the intimacy of fellowship and communion one with another is the most sacred and, and profound relationship on earth. And uh, what is marriage? So working on defining this. What is marriage? Well, marriage is a covenant. That doesn't do you any good, does it? Because most people don't know what a covenant is. So, well, you hate when you have to define your definition. <laughs> but marriage is a covenant. Well, what's a covenant? A covenant is easy to define by defining what a covenant is not. Okay? A covenant is not a contract. A covenant is not a contract. You guys know what a contract is. We see them all the time, right? You buy a car. You go sign a whole bunch of paperwork before you get your car, right? You, 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 you buy a house. Oh, my. I think I signed more. When we bought our house out in Washington, I think I signed more papers buying the house than I did when I went in the military. And it's a contract. And two parties, they come together. They agree to certain terms. And you know, if one of those parties breaks those, any part of those terms, then the other side is free, is relieved of their end of, the, end of the deal, right? That's a contract. We get that. We understand that. Those are, those are things that we are, are well aware of in our society today. But a covenant is something much more permanent. And it's something that we don't see very often today in business, in fact, I'd say I've never seen it done in business. And even in, in marriages today, it doesn't seem to be covenantal. It seems to be contractual. You break terms, I'm out of here. And um, a covenant is a relationship, an agreement that says, I am sticking through this no matter what. No matter what the other side does, I have obligations. I am bound by a covenant. And a covenant is, is I keep my side regardless. It's not a contract. You see the contrast? Very stark contrast, isn't it? And a marriage is a covenant. Where do I get the idea that a marriage is a covenant? Well, turn forward to Genesis 15. We're going to pick up in verse 7. And I would say... The chapter 15 of the book of Genesis is one of the most important chapters of the Old Testament. It's not necessarily the most important, but it's one of the most because there's some foundational truths here that cannot, you cannot understand <clears throat> much of what Christ did without understanding Genesis 15. So Genesis chapter 15 and verse 7 Just before verse 7, God made a promise to Abraham. He said, Abraham, I'm going to give you all this land. I'm promising you all of this land. God made a promise. And this is what happens after that promise. Verse 7. He said unto him, I am the Lord that brought you out of Ur of the Chaldees to give you this land to inherit it. And he said, this is Abraham, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? And he said unto him, this is, God told Abraham, Take me a goat, a heifer of three years old, a she-goat of three years old, a ram of three years old, and a turtle dove and a young pigeon, 
And he took unto him all these and divided them in the midst and laid each piece one against another, but the birds divided he not. And then uh, verse, tw- uh, let's jump down, or I'm sorry, verse 11, keep going here. And when the fowls came down upon the carcasses, Abram drove them away. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and lo, and horror of great darkness fell upon him. Now I want you to just jump forward to verse 17, continuing the narrative. He says this, And it came to pass that when the sun went down and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. In the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto your seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates, and it goes on to define the land. What in the world is going on there? That, what happened? Well, God, Abraham asked God, God, how will I know that I will inherit this land? And God said, Abraham, take these animals, part them one on this side, make an aisle. I want you to make a path. You can see how that picture is there. And what was going on here was, it's un, you and I, we don't see this happen today. But there was common practice in the Eastern uh, traditions, rituals, when two parties would come together to make an agreement, that they would take and they would part these animals, and they'd do this very thing. They would actually lay these animals, and the two parties would walk between, down the aisle, so to speak, between these creatures that have been cut in half. And they would walk that aisle. And what they were doing was, they were symbolizing, they were saying, in very essence, what they were saying was, may I be cut up this way if I should terminate or if I should fail to complete my agreement. And that might seem archaic or even kind of barbaric. (laughs) Like, whoa, that's pretty intense. May I be cut up if I don't hold up to what I said I was going to do. It's pretty intense, right? And it, but it might surprise you some of the idioms that we have in the English language still today that are actually remnants of this idea. When you say to someone, hey, I'll cut you a deal. You know that's actually covenant. That's a, those are covenantal terms. I will cut you a deal. We're entering into a deal. That's, that's the remnants. Now, and it's actually the same thing when we think, oh, wow, how could this be? Uh, may, I, may I be cut up if I don't keep my end of the deal? Well, you know, little kids do the same thing today. Cross my heart and hope to die. You know, that's a very, what we've got left here, these are idioms that we use in the English language today, that they're just leftovers, the remains or the ruins, shall we say, of a Judeo-Christian culture that once understood what a covenant was. Today, we don't, we're just their words, right? But, but they're the remnants, they're those ruins, like you can trace them back and be like, oh, there was once an understanding of a covenant, and, and today they're just there, but those are, those are words that we use uh, that because we were once a Judeo-Christian historically uh, had a heritage, and covenant, covenants were, were something that were understood years before. Well, let's get back to the story here in Genesis here. What, what's missing? You see, I told you that both parties, they'd walk between the aisle. They'd walk down that path together. That's actually, you ever wonder why we walk down the aisle, and there's family on this side, family on that side. Oh, there's a picture there, isn't there? We don't do the beasts and kill all the animals, right? But we have the family on this side, family on that side. And, uh, but it would make for a good barbecue after, Kevin. I don't know why you didn't do that. <laughs> but uh, but uh, so they, the two parties that were entering into an agreement, they would walk the aisle together. But what's missing here in Genesis chapter 15, if you look and you think about it, now that you know what the tradition was, now that you know what that culture was, Who was missing walking down the aisle? Abraham was missing. Abraham fell into a deep sleep kind of thing, almost like the same sleep that Adam was in. And 
And God alone, represented by that torch that, that went down through, that represented God, God alone walked down that aisle. And what do we learn here? Uh, only, only God made that walk. Teaching us this, that God would keep his promise to Abraham regardless of Abraham. Regardless of what Abraham was able to do. That Abraham was not, it wasn't, God didn't say, Abraham, I'm going to give you this land and I'm going to make you a great nation if you meet all my criteria. Meet all these terms and I'll do this. No, God's, God alone walked down that aisle and he said, I am bound, I am going to bless you, Abraham, and you will be blessed. And it was regardless of Abraham's ability to perform. Good works had nothing to do with Abraham's being blessed. And as history shows, Abraham was not all, after this day, there are many accounts of Abraham not doing godly things. There are many accounts where we're like, hmm, wow, Father Abraham did that? <laughs> Shouldn't he be a godly man? Shouldn't he be better than that? Well, he did do some things after this. And what if God said, nope, all right, you did that, I'm done. Your promise is nullified. That was not a covenant. What I'm trying to drive at is what is a covenant? A covenant is a one side is not, it, it's not, it's not dependent on the other side. That God made a covenant with Abraham that regardless of Abraham, God was bound because he went into a covenant. He was bound because he bound himself. It wasn't based on Abraham's ability to perform. And there's a deeper truth. We're going to get to marriage here. How does this relate to marriage? How do, there's a deeper truth to be learned in this truth right here that salvation is not by works. What pastor's been teaching about in Galatians, this is exactly it. That salvation is not by works. Salvation is not even kept by works. You can, you know, I can enter into an agreement easy enough. I can sign any dotted line just like the best of them. But I can't always keep the conditions of that agreement, right? I can, I can go buy a house today, right? Blah, <laughs> I did it. But then if I fail to keep the terms of that contract, whoosh, it's no longer mine, right? A covenant is not that way. And salvation is a covenant. And salvation, your salvation is not kept by works. Salvation is by God alone. By God alone. It's a covenant, a con not a contract. And this is the relationship that Christ has towards his church. Jesus keeps you no matter what. He's faithful, whether you're faithful or not. Think of the times, I don't have to ask you if you've ever been unfaithful to Christ. Think of the times that you, and I'll think of the times that I've been unfaithful to Christ, and he was there to receive me back. Isn't that, that's, that is a covenant. He could have said, if it was a contract, he would have said, whoa, you broke the line. I'm out of here. You're no longer saved. But Jesus keeps you no matter what. He never divorces you. Amen? He never says, ah, I'm done with you. And there's a deeper truth still. There's a deeper truth still. This is what Paul is driving at in Ephesians chapter 5, which Don read just a little while ago. Turn to Ephesians chapter 5. There's some, un, there's some culturally unacceptable stuff in Ephesians chapter 5. But we're going to read it anyway. Verse 22, I had Don read from verse 15 because I wanted you to get a greater context, but now that you've seen a greater context, uh, we'll hone in on the, on the specific area here. Verse 22, wives, 
Submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands and everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loves his wife loves himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Oh, I thought you were talking about marriage, Paul. No, I'm talking about Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. This is what Paul's driving at. He paints this beautiful picture of marriage. A beautiful concept of marriage. The woman's liberation movement despises this. Because it's not, it's not up to what they want it to be. But they say, how dare you teach such bigotry? But look at the picture. Just be honest with the text and say, look at the picture. Is this bigotry? If a man would actually obey what the Bible teaches, there would be a man who would love his wife like Christ loved the church. How did Christ love the church? He loved it, cared for it, and died for it. A sacrificial love. A giving love. See, the scripture does not, in women's liberation, if you're on, if this is ever going out on air, understand the Bible does not teach that men should abuse authority. That men should, you know, treat their wives like cavemen and cavewomen and drag them around and cook my dinner and this foolish, foolish concept that people beat they, they misuse Ephesians chapter 5 for their own gain and, 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 and batter women in the name of Christ. And that is a misuse of the Scripture. And so then the, they, they knee-jerk react to it and throw the whole Scripture out and say, oh, look what the Scripture teaches. No, the Scripture does not teach such foolishness. It does not teach abuse. It does not teach abuse of authority. Christ does not do that. And we are to be as Christ. And so he cared for and, and sacrificed for his, his bride, the church. And so the Bible doesn't teach that. Christ doesn't act that way. The Bible paints a beautiful picture, a beautiful picture of marriage. Humans, humans, I say humans, not just man, but man and woman, both, distort and abuse what the Scripture teaches, but God and His Word are not to blame for that. If we just take God at his word and say, wow, if man were to do this and woman were to do this, beauty, beauty, right? But but we we tend to look at the abuse of what is said and say, oh, that's what scripture teaches. No, that's not what scripture teaches. But if a person were to say, wow, that's what the scripture teaches, that's a beautiful thing. That's not bigotry. That's actually exalting women to a position of honor. I teach it this way with our youth. I say, you know, men are like a baseball and women are like that porcelain doll, you know, that beautiful porcelain doll that you, you know, what do you do with a baseball? It's strong, right? Which one's stronger? Chat, which one's stronger, a baseball or porcelain? Yeah, the baseball's stronger, right? So that makes men better, right? Men are better than women because men are stronger, right? Well, what do we do with baseballs? <laughs> we hit them, boom. We, we, we miss you. They might roll in the mud, right? Oh, go get the ball. 
Don't even think about that, right? Just go run out and grab the ball. But what do we do with that porcelain doll? Put it up on the shelf in the light. Say, wow, look at this doll. It's from my great-great-grandmother. She gave it to me. And we exalt it. We put it in a position of honor. Just because it's a weaker material doesn't make it less valuable. In fact, it gets exalted, right? So the idea that the scripture teaches that one is exalted or that, that men are somehow above women is, is not a biblical position. Although it does use terms that one is weaker and the other stronger, that doesn't make one better and one lesser, right? So uh, the deeper truth that, that we're driving at here, if we understand that, that a covenant, and that's what Jesus entered into with the church, is that he's unconditional. There's a deeper truth still, and that is that marriage is simply a picture. What do I mean by a picture? Well, if I told you my next picture is a picture of our moon, okay? So get a picture in your mind of the moon. Now let's pretend that I'm talking to a bunch of people who've never seen the moon. So I'm going to teach you about what Earth's moon looks like. The accuracy of the picture is important. And so I have a picture of our moon. And this is the moon that orbits the Earth. And it's a very special thing, right? It's, it's a nice moon, right? Well, you guys don't know because you've never seen it, right? You all, you are, you all know that's not our moon, right? Is that a good picture of our moon? No, that's a terrible picture of our moon, right? Why is it a terrible picture? If I were teaching, if I were lecturing a group of Martians <laughs> who've never seen the Earth's moon before, and I said, this is the Earth's moon, well, you'd all take copious notes, and you'd say, oh, look, that's the Earth's moon. It has rings. Looks a lot like Saturn. It's, uh, <laughs> uh, and, and you'd start to learn about the moon. You'd say, oh, yes, I have now formed an idea that the Earth's moon has rings, looks much like Saturn. And yes, now I understand the moon of the Earth. And it's because of the picture that was given to you. And you'd make judgments on, on the moon in such a way, right? It's a terrible picture of the moon. You've made false, false ideas in your mind based on it. Well, here's a little bit more accurate one. We're going to go from least accurate to most accurate, okay? The next one is actually a picture of Pastor Vale, okay? All right. Here we go. <laughs> well, we know this isn't quite accurate because Pastor would never be caught with that hat on. Uh, he has another hat he wears. <laughs> uh, but it's a little more accurate. But if, we, if I said to you, now, people, I want to introduce you to Pastor Vale. This is Pastor Vale. Well, you'd start to... You'd start to make some assessments of Pastor Vale based on the picture that I've presented. And although you might ascertain that he plays golf, you might not ascertain much more about his spirit. You wouldn't necessarily, uh, you know, you wouldn't necessarily learn much about him as a person accurately. Okay, so maybe it's a little bit more accurate than the moon was. But now here's a real accurate picture of a, of a beautiful bride and a, and a handsome groom. And that's right there. Oh, right. Where are they? Where are they? Are they here? Okay. Well, we went from the least accurate to the most accurate. Now we want to look at pictures. I want to show you one more picture to show you the power of a picture. Because what I'm saying is, is that marriage is a picture. And this, this is, the next picture is a picture of Christ with the church. Okay, here it is. There it is. Isn't that a nice picture of Christ with his church? See, Jesus has turned his back on the church, right? Isn't that right? That's a good picture. Isn't that an accurate representation of the church and Christ? No? You know, I tried to find a picture. I felt almost blasphemous typing it in. Jesus forsakes the church image. Uh, couldn't find it because it's, it's just not, <laughs> it's not what, it's not the images of Christ. I had to do this because I could not find anything that I had to, okay, I'll have to improvise here. And so, look, here's a picture. If I teach you that this is a picture of how Christ is with the church, when the church does something wrong, 
Jesus turns his back. Is that a good picture? It's a terrible picture. And yet people who are at the art gallery, which is called the world, watching, they say, huh, that's how Jesus is with the church. The power of a picture. The, so this is an inaccurate picture. Does Jesus turn his back on us? It, when does Christ do that? When you're unfaithful? And I use the word unfaithful because it does pertain to marriage. When you're unfaithful to him, when I'm unfaithful to him, Christ never leaves. Never. No disclaimers. <clears throat> no exceptions. What do we see? What is the picture of Christ in the Bible? It's the one of the prodigal son where his arms are turned. He'd be turned around and he'd be saying, come back. Come back. Let's work through this. Let's talk it out. Let, let's deal with it. Repent. <clears throat> There'd be steps that need to be taken, obviously. <clears throat> Excuse me. But he would receive us back, wouldn't he? He would gladly bring us back. The prodigal son, lost sheep, lost coin. <laughs> There's so many in the scripture that teach us that Jesus goes towards, goes towards us. He doesn't turn his back on us, right? And, and you say, well, what are you teaching? Are you teaching that, shall I say the words, once you're saved, you're always saved? Yes, I am. I'm teaching that because that's what the scripture teaches. If, but you say, well, in the opponents, those who are so adversely opposed to the teaching that, that your salvation is secure, generally what the problem is is that this is the argument, okay? They say, what will, if you go around teaching people that, what will keep you, keep you from sinning? Now, that's a, it's, a, it's a concern, right? And I, and I know this, I know it well, because when I first got saved, I wasn't saved in a Baptist organization. I was saved in another organization that taught, and I went to Bible school, and I learned all the doctrines concerning how you can lose your salvation. And, I, and then I met Sarah. And Sarah and I, she came from a, from a Baptist background, and one night we, were, <clears throat> we were engaged or about to be engaged, and um, no, we weren't engaged yet. Yeah, we, were engaged. we were engaged. So, two in the morning, out on her porch, uh, having a theological discussion, and she believed that she was secure, and I said, what keeps you from sinning? <laughs> I was so angry. That someone would teach such devilish doctrines that you can't go to hell once you're saved. And, and I was so angry at the idea. And she, and she said to me, love. Love keeps me from sinning. I laughed. I scoffed. I said, Pop! I, Poppycock. Okay. I, I really did. I, I, I was like, that's the most absurd thing I have ever heard. I've, that is foolish. I did not know that love could restrain a person from doing the thing which would hurt the one that you love. It wasn't, we did resolve that issue. The Lord brought me, the Lord, the Lord brought me through a series of struggles to look at the scripture and realize that my position on salvation was wrong. And I left the school that I was in and I started attending a Baptist um, church there, and I hated my Sunday school teacher, because every Sunday morning, he'd talk about the salvation, the eternal security, and I'd think, Mr. Flansburg, that guy, he'd, he'd ground me the wrong way, and I was like, he knows this is not what I believe, and he'd teach it anyway. Well, uh, <laughs> but uh, you know what I found out, and, and here, we wouldn't have got married if we didn't resolve that issue. It was an important issue, and um, one day I was, we were married, and one day I was at the grocery store, and you know all the smut that's on the line there, all those magazines, as you're walking through the line, and uh, you can look all you want if you want, go ahead, it will destroy you, but I found myself casting my gaze down, and, and in my heart, you know what the Lord taught me? He said... <clears throat> 
I didn't just cast my eyes down because I fear my wife. I cast my eyes down because I love her and I don't want to hurt her by doing that. And the Lord taught me something that day, that love can restrain. And in fact, it's a better motivation than fear. And so and, and it, fear will get you so far, but eventually you overcome that fear and you're like, ah, forget it. But love will compel you to live a life for the other. And we should be moved as we understand that we're saved by grace and kept by grace and only by grace. That should not motivate us to go out and sin, should it? In fact, the scripture teaches us otherwise, that we should be moved in a response towards Christ, towards a holy life. We shouldn't be, you know, <laughs> Jared and Amanda here? Brandon and Emily here? Brandon and Emily. Dakota and Natalie here? My, where's the, the quartet the, of, of marital? And Brianna and Tyler. Okay, I got two of the four recent ones here. When you were at the altar and you heard, well, you heard each other say, I love you and I'm going to stay with you in sickness and in health till death do us part no matter what. Tyler, Brandon, I bet as soon as Brianna said that, as soon as Emily said that, you said, yes, now I can go do what I want. She made a promise. I can go abuse it because she made a promise. Right? That's what you guys thought. No? Well, no, no kidding. <laughs> well, <laughs> of course not. Teaching that salvation is by grace does not make a person think, oh, I'm saved and I always will be. I'm going to go abuse Christ. That is not what, that's absurd. And that's exactly the way it is with marriage. And in, in, in marriage is exactly as it is with salvation. Because Christ, because the church and Christ are a picture. I mean, I'm sorry, the, the marriage is a picture whoops, of the church. Now, a convicting thought. I know this is a convicting thought. It convicts me. And I, uh, Think about this. What kind of picture do your actions within your marriage show the world about Christ? Not your spouse, you can't control your spouse. But what, so just, just you, you can't control your spouse. What do your actions within your marriage teach the world about Christ? If you're painting a painting, because the marriage is a picture of Christ and the church. So I hope you understand why I went through all those pictures. Because a good picture will help a person come to realize, oh, that's, that's the moon. But a bad picture will teach them, oh, that's the moon. And they'll be wrong, right? So the world is getting a picture of who Christ is with the church. And does the world see Christ as fickle? Does the world see Christ as conditional? Your marriage is a picture of Christ. My marriage is a picture of Christ. What kind of picture am I painting? What kind of picture am I painting? Am I painting one like Saturn? It's calling it the moon. Am I painting one that's not actually representative of Christ? Now I want to pause because what I don't want to do here, I don't want to discourage or browbeat. It's not my intention. I have no desire to do that, none whatsoever. Those who have come through difficult situations, um, marriages that have failed in the past, that's not my desire in any way, shape, or form. My heart, actually, I'm hoping that perhaps you're my greatest ally because you can say with me that you understand how it is that cutting of the covenant and that when two become one and when divorce happens and there's this ripping apart, that you understand that pain and you can say amen because you're like, yeah, I don't want that to happen. My, my desire is not to browbeat or discourage in any way, but to actually think that perhaps you would, you would understand more than anyone else what, what's, what's going on and how important this is. The cutting of a covenant and how two become one and then they're ripped apart and the pain there. And so I'm not intending to open up old wounds or anything like that, 
Uh, but what I want to do is actually encourage, give a word of encouragement as I begin to close here. Those of you who are right in the throes of a marital struggle, battle, you can still paint a good picture of Christ. You, whether your spouse or it does or not, you, you be the one that's like Christ. Be faithful. Be there if the opportunity for reconciliation comes. Just be there. Like the Christ with the prodigal. You can't control the other, but you can control you. And be faithful and be patient. Sometimes, I, I believe that sometimes Christ is seen most clearly when those kind of trying situations come. I've seen Christ more clearly when a marriage has been tested and under fire and the one has actually remained faithful when they didn't need to be according to the world's standards. And the world looks on and says, I don't understand that. I don't, I don't understand that. Can you, why are you even caring about this anymore? It seems so dissolved that shouldn't you just be getting on with your life? And then you can say, well... My marriage is a picture of Christ with the church, and Christ never left me, and I'm going to stay here. That's, those are hard truths. I know. They need to be heard, though, and they need to be heeded, I believe. Today's Veterans Day weekend, someday this week, Wednesday, I guess. I thought it was Monday. But, you know, I may have been inclined to preach on something different, but, you know, to tie it into Veterans Day... Soldiers, when they go in the military, they take, a, they take an oath that they will defend against enemies, foreign and domestic. And today, maybe you're not in the military. Maybe you never have been in the military, but the greatest thing you can do for your nation is to pick up and fight for your marriage. Pick up and fight for the marriages of others. Because when the foundations crumble, what can be done? And marriage, marriage is the foundation of a healthy nation. And so pick up arms, not, not physical arms, I'm saying, but you know, fight the good fight. Encourage one another to stay with it, to, 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 to duke it out in a good way, but to be there, to, to, to take up an oath to say, I will fight against enemies foreign and domestic, those in my marriage and those out of my marriage, I will, I will not stand by idly, but I will defend the very bedrock of our society, starting with my own and then helping others beyond. Next week, I intend to deal with the destructive attitudes and behaviors that have been adopted by America concerning the church, concerning marriage, and, concern, and even within the church, um, to help expose Satan's attack. You know, marriage has been being attacked for at least 40 to 50 years pretty hard. I mean, it's always been under attack, but in America, it's been under attack really hard for 40 to 50 years. And, there are, and in any war, there are different fronts, right? And you have to fight these different fronts. But there is a front that the church has completely abandoned concerning marriage. We're over here fighting this front. Blah, 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 blah. Get them. Don't, don't let that happen. And what we've done is we've shifted all of our attention over here. And we've abandoned one of these most pr primary fronts concerning marriage, and I intend to deal with that next week. My hope is, is that you'll be encouraged to not quit, not throw in the towel. And if you have thrown in the towel, be like Christ. Be like the one who says, I'm, I'm, maybe, maybe that marriage is dissolved, but you can still be painting a good picture of Christ. And, and I really mean that, that. And actually, in those situations, you can actually paint a more clear picture of Christ than some others who've never been in that situation. I believe that. I'm not just saying that. And uh, so take encouragement, I, I hope. And, and let God's word be our instructor. Not, not what do I want to hear, not what do I want to feel. But Lord, shape me and mold me 
by your word and help me to be molded by your word in areas where maybe the rest of the world is not, is not interested in. Help me to follow your word. Amen. Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, Lord, I just ask that you would be our teacher and that you'd be our guide and that you'd be our encourager. And Lord, I just ask that you'd help each heart here that they'd know that this was shared with love and concern and not with any other motives, but to protect and, and um, equip the sheep of God. And I pray that you would that you'd do that work, the ultimate work in the hearts and that you would bolster marriages, that you would help us as a nation, that we would, uh, that that in our own homes we'd be able to improve the quality of our communities and of our state and the nation as we work to defend and preserve and protect our marriages. And I thank you, Lord, for each veteran, for those who've picked up arms and are willing to pick up arms, and ask that you'd bless them on this day. In Jesus' name, amen.